Welcome back. You might notice it's a, a little bit of a mess in here. We've been working very diligently on the deck, so it means it has just been raining sawdust down here for several days. <laughs> days. Days. Weeks. Weeks. Um, but once we get the deck on, we are going to come down here and this winter work on connecting all of these systems. So the water tanks, the stove, the galley stove, the sink, it all needs to be plumbed in, through hulls put in, that whole jazz, vented loops, and that is going to be a pretty expensive process as we come into the, to the last bits of the build. And we haven't talked about finances in a long time. Once we hired on Ben and Ann and then KP, it gets a little complicated to, to talk about money without divulging people's you know, private information. But we're doing another t-shirt campaign. Um, you want to turn around and show that? Long live Victoria, since we sent all of the goods from Victoria to Bob Emser for being put into the tender, and the bronze is getting cleaned up to go on the deck, and Victoria is really starting to be integrated into Arabella. Um, but you might wonder why you should go you know, buy another t-shirt or become a patron or any of that support. And what I can tell you is that <clears throat> Every single penny that comes in through Patreon and every single penny that comes in from YouTube ad revenue, which are the two big main income streams, all goes towards payroll for KP, Ann, and Ben. So if you donate through Patreon, if you watch the videos, um, all of that revenue literally just goes to pay Ben, Ann, and KP and keep the production of the videos going. The merchandise sales and the donations through the website and the wood offcuts and that kind of thing, that's what allows me to make ends meet and that's what pays for everything that happens here in the boat. Um, so when we buy vented loops, when we buy table saw blades, when we buy sandpaper and rubber gloves and dust masks and hose clamps and everything else that we're going to need to finish out the systems and do all of the finish work. That all comes from the Bonfire t-shirt campaigns, that comes from the merchandise sales off the website, uh, general donations, uh, and that kind of thing. So thank you for everyone who donates through Patreon. That's our real big bread and butter, and that's what allows us to make payroll. Um, and thank you so much to everyone who has contributed in another way, or bought one of our t-shirts, or pens, or any of the other merch stuff that we've done because that's what allows us to keep the shop funded and to, uh, to have the materials and tools that we need to finish building Arabella. It's a fairly tight budget, but it's a budget that we've been able to make work, and uh, there's no way we'd be able to do that if we had to buy lumber as well. No so way. thank you, my ancestors, for hanging on to this piece of property, and thanks to the folks who have donated some of their local timber. Uh, that, mm -hmm. that really also made a huge difference. Yep. So anyways, enough about finances and t-shirt campaigns. This was the last weekend for the Long Live Victoria. Um, so go to the link in the description below, go to our website, and you can um, find your way over to the Bonfire campaign and order one of those. And thank you so much for following and contributing. Couldn't be doing this without you. And we'll see you here every Friday morning. After the weeks and weeks of work that it's taken to ready all of the deck planks, from the milling to the scarf joints and the sanding and the painting, it's finally time to start attaching them to the beams, starting with the longest one that runs from the cockpit to the bow. So we have a curved line here, yep. which represents where this decking butts up against the nib plank. Right. We measured over an inch and now have a straight line which represents that one inch that we're gonna come into the decking. Yep. And then let's 
I really love these little sliding squares because you can set this perfect to one inch. And this is a little tricky because there's the cocking bevel on here. Yeah. But this will let you get deeper. down past yeah. it. And then we just want to go Got it. One inch. And that'll okay. give us a one inch deep nib. Yeah, so then we cut here. And cut there. Here. And then you can take this traced line. This doesn't matter. You can just make this a straight cut. Straight, okay. I mean, and it's just so like, slight. It's anyway. so slight, yeah. And it's fine if all the nibs are straight at the end. We don't need to try to match the curve of the deck. Yeah. Okay. So in reality, trace the bottom, turn it into a straight line, take a square, Come down gotcha. one inch, or you know, see so a one-inch nib, cut that across, yeah. and then yeah, you're gonna take off all of that, mm -hmm. flip this over, slide it up to where this point meets right up in here, yeah, and then just trace, just trace and it, then cut that saw, down at ninety. Saw. Okay, all right, and then put the caulking bevel into the nib plank. I think that you're gonna have to handsaw or chisel. Thankfully, the pine's so soft. The pine is very soft. It's very, very soft. Just be careful you don't blow out the back edge right. when you get down there. This will also have to get a backing block. So that'll just go. So this will roughly be yeah. here. So. Now just put it uh, parallel to the deck beam Okay. as best you can get it. Just so that that edge has some support when we yeah. cock it. Before Steve could start laying the planking on the port side, he needed to repeat the work on the covering board that he had done previously on starboard. After sanding, he could cut the decorative bead into the locust, and then round off the covering board, install the nib plank, and bolt in the bronze tow rails. Oh, 
been working on putting the bead in here. Uh, the bead is mostly decorative, but its real function is to be a division line between the oil deck and the painted hull. Uh, with the covering board here, it gets rounded over. Uh, you'd have to just kind of strike a line or just having some physical boundary is a really nice and it'll visually look good. So KP and I, I ordered up this little beading tool and KP and I played with some beads and some coves and decided that just the big bead we thought looked really nice. And you can see down here, it's pretty much finished. Here, it's not existent and it's in process. And what we'll do is we'll paint the hull right up to the bottom and we can paint very easily up to this line. And then we'll probably oil the bead and oil up onto the deck. And uh, that should give us a really nice break and it should make it so years down the road we should be able to still just paint right up to that line um, and keep this bead here open. So the way this tool works, it's basically just a scratch stock. Um, there's two little handles here and I did the first bit with those little handles and then my thumb started to hurt. And I don't know if you can tell, but this knuckle's pretty swollen. And then I picked up the beading tool yesterday to work on port here and put my thumb there and I was like, oh, yep, that's why that's swollen. <laughs> Yeah, and I can bend that one like that, and that one like that. Ow. So, there's definitely oh. a tendon in there that's pretty pretty angry right now. Uh, and that was from just pinching and pushing on these little handles. Uh, so, I think if you're doing a jewelry box, which is kind of what this is designed for, no problemo, doing 40 feet of locust is a little different but the vice grips work, work really great. And part of the reason that I'm using this tool over a router is that I have this tiny little bearing surface and it's rounded. So the shear line changes shape as you go down the hull. And at midship, the junction between the covering boards and the hull is almost 90 degrees. But as you go to stem and stern, that gets more acute and following that with a router and keeping the bit here would mean that we'd have to have the router base rocked and trying to ride on this edge and uh, it's so much work for the covering boards and for the shear strake that i really don't want to mess that up uh, so doing it with this tool it lets us follow that changing bevel really well and if it does start to make any sort of mistake it does it really slowly and it's easy to correct where routers are a little less forgiving, although a lot faster. So to start this, we put the fence on and I'm gonna drag it forward and have the cutter faced back and just drag this top tip and form my line. Now, if I go too fast or I'm not careful enough, and you can even see it starting to happen here a little bit, that one tooth will follow the grain. That little variance is fine at this point because once things get developed, that'll disappear. But it's real easy just to kind of run up on a grain. So I do some light passes. And now as I start to deepen and define that top one, I start to bring the tool from up a little bit so I'm just dragging that top tooth and slowly bring it down so that that bottom tooth is starting to make contact. I've found if I try to start with both it tends to follow the grain more and it gets squirrely. If I start just like that with that bottom tooth out I can focus on the top one and get a good groove to start to follow and then the bottom one catches it and I work the tool like this on the push stroke and then as it gets deeper and defined, you just stand the tool up and eventually you're 90 degrees down, you're 90 degrees to the face and it gives you the full depth. And I gotta be really careful not to cock the tool because as you can see, they're gonna start to not line up.
So once I get it roughed in like this and established, I can really, really start to put some muscle behind it. Start to remove some material. And it also works on the pull stroke. So if you get some grain tear out, just turn it around and come at it the other way. That'll clean up as we get in a, a bit closer. workout almost done though and it seems like this would take utterly forever but I uh, I haven't done it for more than like two hours at a time and I would say it's taken three-quarters of a day and all to do the beater on the whole boat oh, it's, not so bad. it's not so bad no this side's easier Starboard was harder because the there was nothing to sit on. All right, I think it's time to fire up the belt sander and fare the skin plank in. We'll fasten it and it'll be in.
took a few planks to get into the groove, but Steve ended up flying through the rest. So much that next week you'll get to see Arabella with her foredeck almost completely closed up. But to finish off today's video, a quick look at a side project that David took on this week. Test, test. Hey, um, so what I'm working on today is the block that's gonna sit in this area of the boat that's gonna support the mizzen mast. The mast is gonna come down, it's gonna sit on the block here. It's gonna be a raised area that's gonna be, have a ring on it. It'll basically encompass the base of the mast. And then from below there, there'll be a post down to the keel that'll support the weight of it. And so what I've been working through is some live oak uh, to run it through the surface plane or run it through the joiner and establish two pieces that I can create a, the block with. And the dimensions of the block are going to be from the base of the house back to this area here. So essentially 20, 20 and a half inches. And then as wide as I can get out of that, that pair of blocks so that we have some wiggle room. So as the deck is built towards it, we can shave off what's needed to make sure that there's a, a full piece of decking on either side. Key dimension is this, the diameter of the mizzen base, which I think is about six inches. And so anything that I can make bigger than that will provide that extra bit of beef and flexibility. So that's where I am on this part of the project. Perfect, let's go look at it. So these are the two pieces of live oak that I milled up this morning uh, to use as that base block. And like I said, I ran it through the surface planer. Another key part of preparing for this is that since we know that the thickness of the deck is an inch and a half, I wanted to make sure that whatever I used to join the two pieces together sat within where the decking was. Because again, we might be removing a bunch of material at the top to provide that base for the, the mast. So after surface planing it, joining both sides, I ran it through the table saw to create the dado uh, that will be used to spline it together. And then these are the splines I made out of some, some scrap white oak that we had. If I had used basically the board that I took these splines out of and cut one big spline, the grain of the uh, wood would have been parallel to the, the joint. And so it wouldn't provide that uh, resistance to flex, it would essentially be breaking right down the parallel to the grade of the wood. By cutting off these end pieces and making the grain perpendicular to the joint, you get the maximum strength. And next step is to use the epoxy to, to glue it all up together. Yes? Oh, I'm just, just watching. Do you mind if I watch, is that annoying? No, it's not annoying, I watch you all the time, so. I don't know. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, any tips and tricks? Just that you can't use too much glue. Right. We'll forever have Aaron's footprint on the varnish. <laughs> Aaron, wait, what is it's that? Tacky. It's Aaron's footprint forever on the varnish. Aaron, don't don't walk on there. It's wet. Whoops, there are CDs. Uh.